And of course, that is the song that made Marcia Stevens famous. <laughs> Been around a long time. We've heard that song a long time, haven't we? Amen. But it has a beautiful message, and I feel like that message kind of plays a bit tonight into my message. Luke chapter 19. The gospel is recorded by the apostle Luke, the Gentile physician. Chapter 19, begin it, beginning at verse 1. This is going to be a fairly simple message tonight. <clears throat> Luke chapter 19, beginning at verse 1, and we stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. And the Word of the Lord reads in the King James text, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, 
because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of all my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is, not, is come to seek and to save that which was lost. I'm going to talk for a little while tonight on the topic of who we are and what we do. Who we are, what we do. Master, I thank you, God, tonight for your word. I thank you, Lord Jesus, tonight for the presence of the Holy Ghost that we feel in this place for that wonderful anointed song that Marsha penned so many years ago. Lord, you indeed did say to every one of us, come to the water, stand by my side. I know you're thirsty. You won't be denied. I felt every teardrop when in darkness you cried, and I strove to remind you that for those tears I died. God, tonight we need the anointing like we've never needed it before. God, we need encouragement tonight. We need a boost of confidence. We need our faith to be encouraged tonight. Master, we ask God that your spirit would just come down at this hour and do this for us, Lord. Encourage our hearts to believe you for great things. God, we want to be a faith-filled people. We don't want to be faithless. We want to be believing. Help us this hour, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated tonight, and amen. You know, as human beings, we've been taught, mostly by example a lot of times through our parents, we're taught to judge other people after the outward appearance. You know, mom and dad, we're just a kid, and mom and dad see somebody on the street, doesn't look real savory and doesn't look real good, and they'll say, oh, my, look at that one there, you know, and immediately we become conditioned to judge after the external, after the outward appearance. We, we learn as we grow up to judge a man and to judge his importance in this world by the kind of work he does. Oh, he's a bank president. Oh, he's the owner of this furniture company or he's the owner of that jewelry company and because they have great wealth all of a sudden we think they're a better person we assume they're from a quote higher class than our own we judge an individual by their their stature and their build you see a big muscle-bound fellow you know six foot three and boy you think holy mackerel he could lift up a truck but the truth of the matter is that a man with a great job can still be a crook. That man that you think is so high class and so wonderful because of his position, he can still be rotten to the bone as far as integrity and as far as morality is concerned. Look at the Enron scandal. Hello. And all these people involved who have more money than they know what to do with, and they were tearing it out of the hands of people who didn't have it so that they could have more. And a big muscle-bound man, mother, can be a great big coward. You can take that same muscle-bound man who you think, oh, boy, look at him. He's so strong. He's so powerful. Put him in a U.S. Army uniform and set him out to battle, and he'll be diving behind other men to save his own skin. I remember as a kid growing up, my third grade teacher, Mr. Roach, fourth grade, I'm sorry, Mr. Roach, hated John Wayne. Hated John Wayne. Didn't you, Mr. Roach, said, I wouldn't watch a movie that man makes. I wouldn't watch not a one of them. Said, I can't stand him. 
And I thought, ooh, well, why? Because, you know, John Wayne, everybody loved John Wayne. Even as a kid, I thought John Wayne was just the greatest thing, you know. Yeah. But Mr. Roach said I was in the Army with John Wayne. His real name was, I forget, Marion Michael something. And he said, I was in the Army with that man. He said, I watched him die behind other men. And other men took bullets that spared him his life. Said that's how big a coward he was. He said, I wouldn't give you a nickel for him. He said, I can't stand to see him on the screen portraying these big, brave, you know, powerful men. He said he's the biggest coward in the world. Well, do you know just hearing that was enough? <laughs> to this day, I can't watch a John Wayne movie. No, I just can't watch it. I'm not interested anymore. Because Mr. Roach, what he said, I thought, my God, if that man's character is that Hideous. I don't want to watch him either. If he's that big a coward, like Mr. Roach, and of course I, I held my teacher in high esteem. I loved him. He was a terrific teacher. So I thought, well, if John Wayne really is, is anything like Mr. Roach said, then I don't want to watch him either. I don't want to see him portraying a big, brave, brawny, you know, fighting man, when in reality he's a coward. But see, we judge after appearances. That's how things tend to work. In our primary text tonight, we read of a man named Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus wasn't much to look at. He was awful tiny. He was a little guy. And, you know, it's interesting. We say that a lot of times, you know, you see a man in a great big old Lincoln or in a great big old Jaguar. Or you see him in one of these little sports cars, BMW, you know. And we say, yeah, they're trying to compensate for something, aren't they? And a lot of times, you know, you look in the car and you see the driver and it's some little wrinkled up midget. Some little tiny squatty guy who had not got a whole lot going for him in the looks department. But he can afford a Jaguar. Yeah. You know what he's doing, Tom? He's climbing a tree. Yeah, right. He's trying to be seen. He's not tall enough to stand out from the rest of the crowd. So what he does is he gets something that will help him to stand out. Something that will help him to be noticed. Amen. Amen. You hear what I'm telling you? I remember one time years ago I would go out and my friend Derek, we'd go out and he said to me one time, well, you know, every time we go out, this, I was not in church at the time and I used to wear some real unusual outfits when I'd go out. I just loved experimenting with all kind of different stuff. And I, I mean, I, I look like a rock and roller. I, I wore some real funky stuff. And he said, you know, when you go out, then every head in the place turns and everybody looks at you. And I said, what are you talking about? I had never noticed that until he told me. Then I began to notice it. But he said, you know you're a good-looking guy, and when you wear these outfits, you know, everybody notices you. Everybody turns their head to look at you. Well, see, all of us sometimes got to climb a tree somehow, some way. we got to get to the point where we can be seen. We've got to get to the point where we don't feel like we're just mixing in with the rest of the crowd. We want to be noticed. Some people spend their whole lives, Mother, climbing the tree of professional endeavors trying to become something better so because they like the prestige of their job so that they can tell people oh i'm a banker you know i'm i'm a senior analyst with guaranteed bank <laughs> some people spend their whole lives climbing that tree because they feel like that it's going to help me not to feel like i'm just blending in with the rest of the crowd it's going to help me to stand out a little bit it's going to help me to be noticed it's going to help me to feel like i'm above the rest but you know what's interesting? Zacchaeus didn't climb the tree that day to be seen. Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus climbed the tree that day to see. He didn't climb that tree so that he could be noticed. He climbed the tree so that he could see Jesus. He'd heard about him, and he wanted to see him. And as the Lord is walking down the way, suddenly the Bible says he looks up at this little man in the tree and calls him out by name. How did he know that man's name? When you're God, you know who's who. <laughs> 
he knew Zacchaeus before Zacchaeus was born. But he looks up, and without a hitch, he just says, Zacchaeus, come on down out of that tree. I'm going to stay with you today. I'm going to spend the day with you today. Zacchaeus comes out of that tree, and he comes down and greets the Lord, and he is so pleased and so happy that this man Jesus has condescended to come into his home and spend time with him, that immediately he starts pouring forth with promises, and he says, half of everything that I have I'm going to give to the poor right now. Now, you want to know when somebody's really been born again? Watch their actions immediately following their conversion. When somebody's really been born again, I'll tell you, sometimes their conduct is radical. Sometimes their conduct is almost crazy <laughs> because they're so excited about what God has done for them, just like Zacchaeus was this day. They're so excited that they just want to do everything all at once. They want to do everything they can to make a difference in their world. And if they've done anybody wrong, they want to right it. They want to fix it. Zacchaeus said, and if I've taken from anybody by any means that is not honest and moral, then I will recompense to them four times the amount that was taken from them. You see, Zacchaeus was a little guy, but like I say, little guys oftentimes like to get positions that helped to elevate them. And Zacchaeus was in one of those positions. He was a publican, which means he was a public servant, what we would call today a public servant. He was a tax collector. But the Bible tells us he was not just a tax collector. He was the chief of the tax collectors. So, boy, I'll tell you what. If you think you don't like the IRS people in our world today... Imagine how people felt in biblical times when somebody was collecting tariffs and taxes from them that in their mind didn't even belong there because they were an invading army and they had occupied your land and then they had the gall to come along and charge you taxes besides. Caesar is taxing me. Caesar's up in Rome. I'm over here in Israel. He doesn't belong here. And all of a sudden, I'm supposed to pay tribute to Caesar? So tax collectors were very hated people. They were not well liked. And in that time, it was very common for tax collectors to use all kinds of means to extract all kinds of money from people. They knew that they could threaten and, and cajole, and they knew that they were able to uh, weasel a lot of money out of folks because there was always the threat. They always had the state behind them. They always had the power of the government behind them. So if he said, well, gee, I think you've got 10 cows, and I think you need to pay a cow tax of $10 per cow, you just had to pay it. Because if you didn't, that man could have you arrested and thrown into jail, and you'd sit there and rot till whenever. They didn't have a, a legal system like we do today that guaranteed a speedy process. <laughs> but they didn't have any of those guarantees. They didn't have the system like we did today. You wound up in jail, you could sit there and rot till you died. So Zacchaeus was not a well-liked a well man. And when Jesus called him down and said, I'm going to spend the day with you today, immediately those around him began to do what human beings do best. They begin to judge and they begin to criticize. And they said, this man's a great sinner and he's going to have dinner with this great, with this great sinner. The truth of the matter is, those who were making this observation were every bit as great sinners as Zacchaeus were. Their sins may have been different than Zacchaeus, but their sinner, they were sinners nonetheless. Once you know, that's one of the problems we have when we want to sit in judgment of people, when we want to criticize people. The reality is, their, their sin may be different than ours, but I guarantee you we've got some of our own to reckon with which is why we need to keep our mouths shut 
and try to be compassionate and try to be understanding of folks because there's not a one of us that is so sinless that we're in a place to throw any stones. Amen. Amen. You know, the Word of God tells us in John chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus is speaking and He said, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. You see, you can't judge after the outward appearance because it's, there are too many variables. It's too easy to put on one front and to be something else. Who we are and what we do are not always one and the same. Hello now. You hear me now? Who we are and what we do are not always one and the same. But that's true in many ways, not just in a bad way. You could be a tax collector and be a righteous man. Amen. Matthew was a tax collector when the Lord called him to be a disciple. He was a tax collector. But you know what? He had a love for God and he had a desire to know God. So you can't make a judgment and just say all tax collectors are bad because that's not necessarily true. But you can't make the same judgment and say all preachers are good. Oh, Holy Ghost and I have been talking the last couple of days. The Lord and I have been talking. And there's this one preacher on TV who is a hard, nasty, hateful, rotten thing, if I've ever seen one in all my days. <laughs> and the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, his wife is miserable. And I said, really? He said, if, if she were to ever come out and say what she experiences and what she lives with and what she has to deal with on a daily basis, she would blow that man's ministry right out of the water. And my first thought was, well, Lord, why doesn't she? And he said, because she's concerned for souls. Bless her heart. She doesn't want anybody to lose their salvation over his. So she'd rather be silent and, and suffer silently and deal with his garbage so you see, my friend, I'm telling you right now, you never know. You look at the outward, the externals. Just because a preacher can get up and preach everybody and their brother into hell, it does not mean by any stretch of the imagination that that person is walking in such a state of righteousness that it's a miracle they can keep their, earth, their feet on planet Earth. People only sometimes come under condemnation and they, they come under so-called conviction. When they hear a preacher preaching, and the reason that they do is because they assume that preacher's living what he's preaching. If they knew what that preacher was really living, they probably wouldn't give two hoots about what he had to say. There's a lot of people listening to Jimmy Swagger over the years, and again, I'm not criticizing the man. I'm not trying to judge him, but I'm just using him as an example. A lot of people listened to him over the years, and, and they gave him every bit of credibility. And then when his little habit came out in the news, as it were, all of a sudden, he couldn't get anybody to want to listen to him. That man used to fill auditoriums all over this country with 30,000 people and better. Now, Jimmy Swaggart's lucky if he can get a few people to sit down and watch him on television airing out of his local church, which is two-thirds empty. Because the credibility factor. But you see, my friend, what a lot of people don't realize is some of these preachers that you listen to and that you let make you feel bad about yourself and you let depress you and you let bring all this condemnation and guilt into your life, some of these very same preachers, if you knew what they really lived, if you knew what their home life was like, if you knew what was going on behind closed doors, believe me, you wouldn't have uh, one concern at all as to what they had to say. You wouldn't care for a minute what they were talking about. Their credibility would go right down the sink. Because who we are and what we do are not always one and the same. They don't always line up like they ought to. The word of the God tells the word of the Lord tells us in first John chapter three, verses fourteen through eighteen, this is God's standard. 
Not the world standard. This is how God judges. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. Let me repeat that line. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. Us. Who laid down his life for us? According to this scripture, who? God did. Do you hear me? Let's move on. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. God's standard is different than the world's standard. According to God's standard, if we can be hateful toward our brother in the faith, in God's eyes we stand as a murderer. Amen. Now that, that's pretty severe, isn't it? The scripture says... If you, can, if you are blessed with resources, whatever those resources may be, and you see your brother in need, and you're able to shut up your bowels of compassion, you're not concerned about your brother, you just let it go, you pat him on the back and say, well, I'll pray for you. Rather than try to minister to that need and try to be a help in that situation, the word of the Lord says, how dwelleth the love of God in you. How can you claim that God's love dwells in you? I've had people come to me over the years with uh, news of individuals who were really in bad straits and difficult times. They needed food or whatever the case might be. And without a thought, I gave them the groceries right out of my own cabinets. Without a thought, I gave them the money out of my pocket. Without a thought, I gave them what I had. You know why? Because my attitude was, I'm a person of faith. God's going to take care of me. But that person may not have my faith. They may not have my relationship with the Lord. And therefore, they need my help as a human being. They need some human assistance. I can't just pat him on the back and say, well, God will help you at some point in time. No, it doesn't work that way. How in the world can we see? How can there be people today who see our little church struggling and trying so hard to do something positive and trying so hard to reach out to people that nobody else is reaching out to with this message, and yet they feel comfortable walking away and saying, oh, oh, I'll, I'll just go to this church that condemns everybody and criticizes everybody and sends everybody to hell, and I'll give them my tithe, and I'll go there and support them, and I'll be in their pew every Sunday. How can you do that and claim to have the love of God inside you? I question I seriously question I don't understand it. I don't think you have a relationship with God that's based on love. I think you've got a relationship with God that's based on fear. And you've become convinced that you're supposed to go to church every Sunday and get the fire scared out of you. And Brother Morrow isn't trying to scare you. Brother Morrow is trying to help you receive and accept the embrace of God. And understand the love and grace of God. I'm not trying to scare anybody into heaven or out of hell. The Word of God tells us that David was called a man after God's own heart. And yet David was a man of war. He was a violent man who had gone so far as to kill so that he could take Bathsheba for his wife. But who David was and what David did were very different. Do you hear me now? Who David was and what David did were very different. The Bible tells us in Acts 13, 21 through 23, and afterwards they desired a king, and God gave unto them Saul, the son of Sis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of 40 years. 
And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart. That's God speaking. Which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. So God himself has said that David is a man after mine own heart, and yet David's conduct was not always exemplary. Because who we are and what we do are not always one and the same. The world likes to judge us. They like to try to figure us out and figure who we are based on what we do. They try to figure out who we are by our height, our weight. They try to figure out by our looks. They try to figure out by our profession, what kind of work we do, how much money we make, what kind of car we drive. But who we are, what we do, what we have, what we own, those things are not always indicative of who we really are. David was genuinely a man of faith who loved God and trusted the Lord, but he frequently did stupid things. But never did that change the fact that he loved God and trusted the Lord and was trying to do right the best he could. Amen. The Word of God tells us in Revelation 21, 7 and 8, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving. Notice that the list starts out with fearful and unbelieving. And the abominable, the abominable and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Wow, that's tough. Well, Brother Morrow, does that mean everybody that tells a lie is going to wind up in hell? No, because there's a difference between what we do and who we are. There are some people who are just liars. Amen. It's not about telling a lie. It's about being a liar. Are you following me now? There are some people, I know a man who killed a man, Brother Sensible from Riverside Church of God. But now, now Brother Sensible had to live with the tag uh, the rest of his life of being a murderer. But was he really a murderer or was he a man who murdered? He was really a man who would, he really didn't murder so much because he, he did it in a drunken thing, you know, and it wasn't like it was premeditated and all that. But the idea is, do you understand what I'm saying? There's a difference between doing something and there's a difference between being something. This is why the scriptures warn us, demon spirits operate on the premise of when you open the door to them, when you sell yourself out to them, they'll come in and they'll take up residency. This is why we've got to be very careful when it comes to anything that is not of a godly nature like lying or adultery or any of these things because if we open that door and we convince ourselves it's okay it's not a bad thing it's all right then after a while we've opened that door and a spirit can then come in and no longer have we are we merely a believer who has done something now we become that thing we become an adulterer we become a liar we become a whoremonger you following my line of logic tonight See, that's what demons want to do. They want to change our nature. They want to come in and they want to make that aspect all that we are. They want that to become the premier aspect of our person so that God no longer can see anything else in us but that. That's what they want to do. But there's a difference between having done something, who we are and what we do. There's a difference between doing something and becoming something. Amen. You follow me now. There's a difference. between, And there's a lot of people, we want to judge people a lot of time because, oh, he lied, so he's a liar. No, he lied. That doesn't necessarily mean he's a liar. It just means he lied. Amen. 
husband cheats on his wife. That doesn't necessarily mean that he's a whoremonger just because he cheated once on his wife. We don't understand the circumstances, and I'll tell you, there's a, in, in the male-female psyche, you know, situation, believe me, there are some very understandable reasons why men do what men do sometimes. The problem is, when the man's got everything and he's not justified, you know, there's no justifiable reason for him to do. He's got a wife at home who, you know, greets him at the door, wraps his around wrap every week, and, you know, and, and he's going out together. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm trying to be funny, but at the same time, I'm making a point. You know, if you've got a wife who's there for you in every possible way, whenever and however and whenever and wherever, then there's no reason for him to even be looking. But then you got the others who might have other reasons. And then, again, I'm not justifying what they've done, but what I'm trying to say is this is why we can't afford to judge by appearances because we don't know the whole story. We don't know what people are experiencing, what they're going through. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 5 through 12, and I'm finishing right now. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you, because you go to law with one another. Why do ye not rather take wrong? Why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor effeminate. And I want to make this point because I think a lot of people misunderstand this, and I need to clarify. In the King James, the word effeminate is used. It's a very poor term to be used uh, in translation. In reality, if you look at the original word in the Greek, the term literally translates soft. Well, they applied it as though a person is soft, so to speak. But what they didn't do was take it in context of other scripture and in light of other scripture. If you look at uh, the word of God overall, you learn that when things are referred to as being soft, oftentimes it's referring to those who lived an opulent or wealthy lifestyle. They lived a very soft life. They had a very soft existence. They could afford the fine linens. They could afford the silks. They could afford all the nice materials that poor people wouldn't be able to afford. So their lives were very soft. Therefore, it is more likely that what Paul was trying to say here is certainly not men or people who were soft, i.e. effeminate, but rather what he was trying to say was those who lived a soft existence, speaking of the wealthy, which is in perfect keeping with what the Word of God said, because the Bible said it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. So that would make perfect sense, okay? So I wanted to clear that up. I don't want anybody to hear my voice by tape or on the Internet and hear the word effeminate and think that that means effeminate men. That is not the case. Not at all. Uh, going on, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor uh, revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I read that list to you for a reason tonight. Did you listen to that list? It says, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor idolaters, nor thieves, nor covetous. The point I'm trying to make is that that's talking about not what people do, but who people are. Oh, yes. That's, okay. that's not a list of what people do. It doesn't say, nor those who steal. It said thieves. Didn't say those who drink till they get drunk. No, it said drunkards. You follow on what I'm trying to tell you? Not everybody that drinks is a drunkard. Amen. A lot of kids have walked out of a store with something in their hand, you know, that they didn't pay for. That, they, that didn't make them a thief. 
the whole life they're not going to live as a thief because they stole one time. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? What we do and who we are are not always one and the same. And he goes on to say, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful unto me. Paul says, everything is lawful unto me. There ain't nothing I can't do if I want to do it. But all things are not expedient. Even though a lot of things I could do if I wanted to, I could drink if I wanted to drink. I could have a drink a day if I wanted to drink every day. But it's not expedient. It's not necessary. It's not, it doesn't serve any good purpose for me to do it. So therefore, I'm just as, as, uh, uh, it's just as well that I not. Probably smarter than I don't. Amen. So he said, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Do you see how we ended that? I'm talking tonight about what we do and who we are. He said, I'll not be brought under the power of of any. In other words, I'll not get to the point where I become that. It's not a matter of having murdered, it's a matter of becoming a murderer. It's not a matter of having a drink, it's a matter of becoming a drunkard. Do you follow what I'm saying? This is what Paul is teaching. This is what the Word of God teaches the Christian, the believer. This is what our, uh, is our obligation to God is to live our lives in such a way so as to stave off any of these things taking opportunity in our life. That's why Paul said all things are lawful, but they're not always expedient. Yes, I can do a lot of things, but you know what? If if there's something in my life that could wind up taking me over, it's probably better if I just abstain. People wonder why. Well, why does Brother Morrow still believe in basically in just clear and flat-out abstinence from alcohol. That's the reason. Because alcohol is a dangerous substance. It's too easy. It's too easy to start to look at it as a medication and say, well, I've had a hard day. I'll have a glass of wine tonight. And before too long, you're using it to self-medicate, and you're using it. In, and I know some people, every time they have an argument with their partner or every time they have an argument with their husband or their wife, they run out and buy themselves a beer. First thing they do, it's not good because you're using that as medication. You're not trying to cool down and have a nice refreshing drink. No. You're trying to get a bit of a buzz on so you can get over what the bad things you're feeling. And that is a bad direction to take because then we're opening the door. We're starting to say, well, you know, uh, if, I, if I do it like this and then before too long you're buying a six-pack and before too long you're buying a 12-pack and before too long half of your garage is loaded with stuff. So this is why in the Christian life we have to walk with, with some, some standard. We have to hold a standard. I don't ever want anybody to come into our church and think we don't believe in a standard. We do believe in a standard. may not be the standard of some churches, but we certainly do believe in a standard. You've got to hold some kind of standard in your own life. What I don't want to do, I don't want to impose a wholesale standard on everybody and say, this is God's standard for everybody in the church. No, I'm not going to do that. Because if you don't come into the standard for yourself, That's right. then you're not going to be living it for me, because you don't need to be living it for me. You don't need to be living it for the church. You need to be living it for you and God. Right. So I don't preach a wholesale standard. I don't get up in the pulpit and say, Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. But I hope that with time people will come to an understanding and a revelation and say, hey, you know what, I'd be better off without cigarettes. Yes. You know what, I'd be better off without alcohol. You know what, I'd be better off without whatever. Yes, but I want them to grow into it. I want them to come into it so that, mm -hmm. so that when they finally make that decision, they're making it for all the right reasons. And then when Brother Morrow's dead and buried and I'm out of the scene and I'm not here to keep you on the straight and narrow anymore, you know what, you'll still be on the straight and narrow. Because you didn't come into it because I said it. You came into it for yourself. Amen. Who we are and what we do. Thank God 
Jesus looked at Zacchaeus that day. And he was able to look beyond what Zacchaeus did and see who Zacchaeus was. Amen. He could see a heart that was hungry. He could see a man that wanted to know God. And thank God for that.